Welcome to East Idaho Newsmakers. I'm Nate Eaton. You probably have seen across the country this month it uh, pride celebrations all across the country in cities large and small, including here in eastern Idaho. We're going to be talking with two of the men that helped found pride -a a relatively new organization. Before we do that, I want to read you a little bit of history about how Pride Month came to be. LGBTQ Pride Month is currently celebrated each year in the month of June to honor the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in Manhattan. The Stonewall Uprising was a tipping point for the gay libertarian movement in the United States. In the United States, the last Sunday in June was initially celebrated as Gay Pride Day, but the actual day was flexible. In major cities across the nation, the day soon grew to encompass a month-long series of events. Today's celebrations include pride parades, picnics, parties, workshops, symposia, concerts, and the LGBTQ Pride Month events attract millions of participants around the world. Memorials are held during this month for those members of the community who have been lost to hate crimes or HIV AIDS. And this is the first year that in Eastern Idaho there's really been a, a big pride event, correct? Correct. H how did that come about, Travis? Let me introduce these guys, by the way. This yes. is Travis Kerbs. He's the executive director of Pride Idaho. And then we have Carlos Salas. Salas, who is the vice president. How did you guys come up with Pride Idaho and, and the big event that you held this weekend? So we came up with the event almost two years ago. Um, we seen a high demand and I guess supply and demand for people in not only in eastern Idaho but in the state of Idaho that need help as far as teen suicide, drug overdose, and coming out to their parents we do live in a predominantly LDS community, which is awesome, but unfortunately they don't teach you how to raise a gay, bisexual, transgender son. So learning about the culture or learning about the feelings that you may experience as an individual is hard to teach somebody when you have... Nobody to talk to, who's only looking to, to, or to you about it. guide them or... Uh, we like, when we talk to the, the LGBT youth, uh, we speak from our own personal experience. What we went through when I grew up in Idaho as a gay boy in, in the 80s was difficult. You know, and even, even in today, it used to take courage still to come out of the closet. Even though it's 2019, it's still a stigma. You know, I don't care if you're in a big city or a small community, it still happens, you know. And what we, are, what we our organization wants to do is educate, ways of awareness for the people who are struggling whether they're coming out of the closet or they're still in the closet or they have a talk, difficult, talk, difficult time speaking about it, to, even or to their families. Or matter if they just need somebody, somebody to, 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 to talk to in general. Group. And I am from a big city, so I'm, I've noticed a huge increase of youth in the LGBTQ community. And I'm just like, just, just mind boggling, but it's kind of good though, because we are helping them and we're guiding them, you know, because um, no one should be left behind. We did notice a big um, increase and we said to ourselves, we see the problem, how do you fix the problem? If you, I, I truly believe that if you, you can sit and preach all day you want, but until you want to step up to the plate and help somebody, that's where the big difference is made. And the only way to make a difference is be the difference. We'd rather, we'd rather be the solution instead of the problem. Sure. So in the past there's been, uh, LGBTQ events, but nothing real official. Is that is that correct? Correct. And you guys decided not only should we do the the events, but there really needs to be a support group for, right. for young men and correct. women and older whoever. Correct. To find we are you. a all exclusive age group. Um, just to give you a little bit of history of what we do, we have meetings every other week. We are a 100% teaching learning organization. We are 100% nonprofit. We are registered with the state, official, government, however you want to call it. Um, so every two weeks, we have two meetings every single week, or every two weeks we have a meeting. The first meeting is completely educational. So a board member will go out and they'll teach on whatever subject they want, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be heterosexuality. HIV, AIDS, or any kind of health issues that we have. And as long as they don't bump back to back on the same lesson, then I'm okay with that. The second week we go out and we do something fun. The last big event we had was we went and rented out Skyline Lanes and it was open to the general public. This does one of two things. It brings people to the awareness of Pride Idaho, but also it brings people to so that... In the community. Right. We know that, that it's going to be an impact on people no matter what you do. 
And of course we have the haters and of course we have the people that are Do very- you, How common is that now? The what? The haters where people um, it's shun not, or- Right where we're at right now, it's not as oh. common. We do get the, you know, the, the biggest thing that we do get is people will come and sit down and they'll take pictures or they'll be with their family and they'll just make snide remarks, which is fine. That you can overhear. Yeah, you overhear. right, right, obviously. Take so, pictures of, of you guys together? Just in the event, yeah, in the event or whatever it may be. And um, we, we have a very strong policy that we do not engage in the negative activities. We just let them be and we lead by example. Do you have people that come up to you and say, thank you, or I'm proud of oh, you? Yeah. We oh, have yeah. a, no huge, idea. a huge outreach from the community because they've, they've all, the major, major thing that we've got is the community, from the community aspect, is that they've said this is exactly what we've needed. We need a voice for the LGBTQ when you community. Get other people from the city in Pocatello, like the mayor and other people, are like, we love what you're doing, it's just keep doing it because that to me, being from a big city, and I, I was raised in Pocatello as a gay man, as a young boy. Um, I was kind of literally thinking, oh my gosh, how are these people going to be here? You know, I mean, I have a big city mind, even though I grew up here. I mean, these are small minded people, but to my surprise, amazing. We've had the most amazing reception for our organization in a short amount of time. You know, some organizations like this takes years. And we're talking, I, I've, I've been there in Vegas, I've been involved a lot of non-profit organizations, but it takes years to just get that respect. We've gotten it like pretty quick, you know, and we're trying to send a positive message to the community and especially the youth because they need us the most. They are going to be our right. leaders next year. They're, going, they're, they're the ones that can take over. God forbid, you know, we don't pass away, but you know, um, they are going to be our next leaders. Uh, Travis, would you mind sharing your story with us? When did you know you were gay? How did you come out? Um, I actually knew when I was 11. I was, I was raised in a very prominently LDS community. Here. Correct, yeah. And so it was really, really hard. I was supposed to serve an LDS mission. And then, unfortunately, because of my beliefs, I couldn't, I couldn't really say yes to it. You see what I'm saying? But at the same time, they didn't, because we were the family that I was raised with, I was adopted. The family I was raised with was very, very respected inside the community. So the bishop didn't think it was right, or the religious leader didn't think it was right to just come out. We can't just come out and say, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we can't just say he's gay, so we can't go. Were you out? I was not out, no. But your family knew? No, my no, family didn't even no know until I went on my mission. To, oh, so I you did go on a only, mission? I did not go on a mission. You did no. not, okay. I, was gonna, I got called to serve a mission, and then I told them that I can't. And that, so, is that when you said, because I'm gay? Right, right, okay. exactly. But they didn't want to, because that was back in, gosh, 93, I want to say, 93, 94. So it wasn't, we, we didn't even make as huge advancements as we were then. You know, it was kind of like drugs or marijuana as it is today. Back then it was like the huge no-no. Now today they're very, they're a little bit more receptive to it. So how did you come out to your parents? Um, pretty much in that, with the bishop. I just told the bishop that this is a situation, this is why I can't, and so then they, and you know, I really thought, to be honest with you, I really thought I was gonna, they were gonna put me in counseling and they were gonna do all this stuff. And they didn't, they just, they said, okay, all right. And then I just kind of lost touch with my parents. They kind of just went their way and I kind of went my way. And we just had different beliefs. And so it was at that point I talked to a friend of mine, he was like on his deathbed. And he said, Travis, you, you really need to figure out what you want in life and who you are because the only way you're gonna be, he goes, you're, you could be so successful at so many things, but you may not even real, you don't even realize it yet. And so I said, okay. So I took some psychology classes. I learned who I was and how I, I create myself. And then I decided, you know what, we've got to create a team. Um, and our board, to be honest with you, we have straight people, we have bisexual, we have transgender, and they go from the ages from, I would say from 19, 19 to, up to, well, I'm the oldest, <laughs> 53. So, so it's so just embarrassing, you know. Very, we don't it, discriminate, anyone's welcome. Right, yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're gay, bi, straight, transgender, it doesn't matter. We want you to come and learn. And I honestly believe that if you teach somebody the tools and you give them the tools to learn, 
then you'll be way more successful in teaching someone else about whatever you're teaching them to do. So have you reconnected with your family? Um, I have, yes and no. My sister was in an accident uh, a few years ago, and so that really reconnected us kind of. And then we just kind of lost touch again. So it was kind of, they're there, but. Do, do you feel comfortable, are they accepting now? Have things changed? Or more is so one of those now, I guess more so now than, than ever before, I guess. Yeah. But I don't communicate with them. You don't? No, I don't talk to them. I just, they know where I'm at. They know how to get a hold of me, but they just choose not to. And, so. and you've left the church? Yeah, yeah, correct. Carlos, share your story with us. I knew I was gay when I was eight. <laughs> And in second grade, when, when you were what? Gay. I knew, I knew I was gay in second grade. Second grade. I grew up in Idaho, Pocatello. Okay. I'm from a very predominant Roman Catholic family, being Hispanic and being Latino. And um, the very first person I told, I knew I was gay during middle school, and I was really teased a lot. I was like, I was physically beaten by some of the kids from school. I was chased. I was what you call gay bashed, whatever. But the first person I told, I actually came out to myself, and my family was my grandmother. I was 13. But it wasn't until my late teens, early 20s, that my mother found that I was gay. And so we had that conversation, and she had this difficult time being no, no Latin guy, no Latin boy is gay, you know, and she said all those Spanish words were wrong, but, no, but you know, just, she took it wrong, and she took it really hard. So I didn't talk to my family for quite a while. And a couple of years later, I'm in boys, I'm living in there, and so my mom decided to ask me if I'm still gay. And I think it's when I realized as to who I am, I'm not gonna change, that when she told me in front of my family and friends that I prefer you dead than gay, and I just, I just, it just literally cut ties with my family. Literally cut ties. It was weird because I remember my, fa my sister was keep kind of calling me. It's like, you know what? I want nothing with you guys. I'm done. I'm over it. Just ignore it. So um, it was also hard though, you know, because when you live in a small town, like in Pocatello or Falls, it's, it's, it's very religious, Mormon. You know, you don't see very many Latinos out there or Catholics or whatever. So here I'm living in big cities. I've been in Boise, I've been in Reno, Vegas for like eight, 28 years of my life. So here I am, this Mexican boy living in, in Vegas, all places. I'm like, just like, like naive and gullible. And that's where I got my exposure to the gay community. And that's how I got involved with the gay community is through other people in, in the gay community. It's like slowly. So, um, but eventually my mom came around. She accepted it. I think it was weird when I was dating Marty. The guy I was dating, I would never thought. She came around, she goes, okay. And you brought your boyfriends around the house to uh, meet actually, her? she came to visit me. Oh, wow. Yeah, she came from Pocatello to Vegas to visit me and she just adored him. I'm like, whoa. So that's just like, that's it. Okay, that, that to me was like, that seal of approval, that, that's okay, I got her approval, you know? And then, but um, my relationship with my sisters is just mind-blowing. Supportive, they tell me to be who I am, be true to myself, I am, you know? I, I have always, you know, been who I am, never gonna change. And I, um, being in Vegas actually has really taught me, to, you know, groomed me to become a gay man. Being in Vegas, had gave me so many opportunities to help the LGBT community. I have been involved with 11 nonprofit organizations, from the Red AIDS Project to AIDS for AIDS in Nevada, from the Core System, from the Gay Center. I was actually the volunteer coordinator for the Gay Center for eight years. I dealt with teens of all types, you know, and that's where I got my exposure to, to gay, the LGBT youth group. I'm thinking, boy, these kids are brave. They teach me and I teach them. They're kind of like we teach each other. We show each other what it was like, you know, it's like what it was like then compared to what it is now. You know, these kids are like resilient, they're brave. Like I give them, I give, I give them nothing but respect because it's not easy. Any idea what percentage of Eastern Idaho is LGBTQ? I mean, I know there's no way to know for sure. For but me, my personal opinion, I think I would say I would say 15 to 20 percent. 15 to 20. So they, 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 they don't 25 know. 25 to 30. Yeah. How many are open? Do you think? I would, I would say, say about 15. 15 percent. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely. I would definitely yeah. Say, yeah. I've seen more bisexuals. So I will give you that for a fact. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, yeah. But the truth of it is, too, is that we have a a very large support group of the LGBT community, but because of the past actions of things in the past, in the past, there I I really honestly do believe they're just afraid to 
They're not afraid to express themselves. Like they're not afraid to go to the grocery store or, you know, with their husband or their wives or anything like that. But I think as far as pro-social activity, going out into the Public eyes. public's eyes, they, they are very reluctant to do that. Just because of the as a couple, you mean right. like to a hold couple, hands? Yeah, as a couple, yeah. I mean, yeah. I could go to Vegas. I could see a guy holding hands, kiss. No big deal. Then I come here, and I'm thinking, oh shoot. I, like if you I, went I, to Walmart I, or Winco, you can't hold you, hold, you can't hold hands. Like I could go. People would look at you. I'll look at David, and it's like David's. I had one guy. One of the very few people. I was, I was like, I was, I wasn't. I'm okay to hold hands. He wasn't. Because I know he's from an older generation, but still. He's your partner. Well, he passed away, but we were together for nine years, married. But anyway. I would love to hold his hand, but he wouldn't do it. Even though he's from California, he's from LA, huge city, he still was like reluctant. Mm -hmm. But also think of mine though, this is 2019. You know, and I've been in the gay community since the early 80s. So from the AIDS epidemic, goes, the LGBT community, like you were talking about the Stonewall, how far it has moved. So do you foresee the day in, I don't know, 10, 20, whatever, whatever you think, where Pride of Home might, might not be necessary where it is it's, it's so I think you're mainstream always, right I think you're always gonna have a need for support regardless but as far as us growing in Idaho or Eastern Idaho I really do believe yeah I do believe it's coming I believe that it needs a little bit of boost and a little bit of support or it needs really realistically the the problem of it is is that people in general are most afraid of what they don't understand. And when you've been raised your whole life just with a man and a woman, and then when you see something different, it's like going through your life every day eating hot dogs. And then one day you come along and somebody's eating a hamburger, and you're like, what the heck is this? But then you give them the hamburger and they're like, okay, I'll try it at night when no one's watching. So then they try the hamburger and then they like it, and they're like, oh, well, that's not bad. So it's like the same concept. So you just have to integrate it, and I really believe it's, it's all about education. The bigger problem of it is, is that not just in Idaho, but the facades that happen with the LGBT community and our actions, I'm not gonna justify everything we've done has always been okay because it's not. People, men that go out and dress in leotards or string bikinis or whatnot, whatnot, it does give us a bad image. And so when you bring that to a very conservative city or a very conservative state, people are really reluctant to try to even understand it because we, they see the bigger picture of, well, we already know what you're about. We don't need to learn anything else. You've already showed us who you are. We don't want any part of it. But if they take the time to learn, even each one of these individuals, they would, they would be just so surprised. They would, I think they would be eager to learn more. We're just, we're just, we're just, we're just many women in the, L, in the LGBT community. The only difference is that we like a man or a woman or whatever, and then we're just like any ordinary couple. You know, we have a, here's my husband, we want to raise kids, we just do normal things. We get jobs, we pay off taxes, raise children. It doesn't matter who you are. You're just a human being believing in your own beliefs and your own rights, whatever it is. May be wrong, may be right. Who am I to judge? I can't judge or judge. I can't tell you what you can and cannot do in your personal life, you know? And that took me a long time to learn. It took me years, but having the exposure we have nowadays with, with social media, that way it is about you know sexuality or sexual identity, whatever you want to call it. You know, even I get educated. I get educated. You wouldn't believe from the young kids. Like it's just like whoa. <laughs> I mean, well, speak, speaking of young kids, if there's if there's a, a kid watching right now who who needs someone to talk to or is is struggling with their sexuality, how do they get in touch with you guys? So you can go to our website, it's prideaho.com, P-R-I-D-D-A-H-O.com. That's probably the easiest way. We do have Facebook as well. Or Instagram. Um, and I will let you know that we have helped numerous kids or children, I guess young adults, um, talk to their family about it. They, we had a young lady that joined our group um, and her family was really, really, they just, they wanted to kick her out and then they bashed her and then they, they told her it was wrong and they weren't gonna accept her. And she, she reached out to us and I told her, I talked to her dad about it and she was just mortified of her parents. Like he was saying, she was just mortified. I can't let my parents know, but they already found out. Mm -hmm. And the situation was is she left, I don't know, she was messaging or something like that and she left the messenger opener. 
Her dad read the messages, so he knew before she even knew that he knew. So she, there was a lot of tension building. So the message I want to send to the parents is, is if you do find out that your parents or that your children are LGBTQ, or if you have a suspicion, please don't blow up on them. It's not the answer. Just communicate with them. Communication is key. And you will be amazed at how open they come to you. And this was the message I sent to this individual. He was raised in the military. He had a very high military background. He was very black and white. What was right, what was wrong, everything like that. And very religious. And I explained to him, well, sir, here's the difference. Your daughter has in her brain, just like you have in your brain, she's attracted to a female. It's not going to go away. It's not going to stop. You can't change it. So that daughter that you've been raising for the last 18 years that you love and that you care about, you're either going to, you've got a couple options. Either A, you can continue down the road you're going down, which I can promise you, you will just push her away. And she won't come back. She's not going to, why would you, would you come to a house where you're not welcomed, not welcomed every day, you're not loved, or you even feel that way? You won't. And so you have that option, or the option is B, you can come and learn about not necessarily, you don't have to come to my organization, but just come to any organization and just learn about the cultures. And then you can learn with your daughter together. The best way to do is to educate them on what they are gonna experience. This individual is going through high school and we did have to teach them, you know what, you're, these are the things your daughter's gonna experience. These are the things you should expect as a parent. So don't freak out when she brings home a girl and you walk around the corner and they're sitting on the couch sharing a kiss. Yeah, you know what I mean? When they're doing something like that. I understand your first reaction is fear. Your first reaction is what the heck? It's totally normal. But you need to be prepared for that kind of stuff and what do you need to do? Don't, do I be reluctant? Do I just ignore it? Do I just let it go away? Those are all things that you have to retrain your brain to know how to, how to react to it. If you're a young student, young kid, boy or girl, whatever, and then you're, you want to come out of the closet or you want to talk to somebody about you being gay or bi or transgender, whatever, either talk to somebody you feel comfortable with, a teacher, a, an authority like a counselor, a, a, or somebody um, that you feel safe with, go to a center. There's, there's, there's actually 800 numbers to call, you know, because there's been a huge increase in teen suicide, whether you're gay, straight, bi. I mean, I'm like, I just like, I can't believe it still happens to this day. Well, good work. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos, Travis, thank you very much for joining thank us, you. guys. Absolutely. Thank you for watching. Have a good week.